Hi everybody, I want to talk uh, in this lecture about um, uh, cattle raising and farming in Southern Africa um, in, in uh, pre-modern or pre-colonial times um, uh, with the understanding that uh, the, the largest group, the largest uh, percentage of people in Southern Africa historically and at present um, are the various Bantu peoples. Uh, that word uh, I will explain in a few minutes here, um, but uh, most Bantus arrived, as we talked about in the last lecture, um, between, well, over the course of many centuries, bringing with them mixed farming uh, economies, uh, the use of iron and copper and other things, um, and the type of society that they produced ultimately became the dominant one, the most common one in Southern Africa. And we have to understand something about that pre-modern society to capture the, um, or to investigate and, and comprehend the uh, actions of the, the Bantu peoples in more recent times. Um, the traditional way of life doesn't disappear and continues to be important in the modern world. And so we need to have some sense of what came before here. Um, now, even though most Bantus participated in mixed agriculture, uh, cattle raising was tremendously important for them as it was for the Khoikhoi who relied almost entirely on the raising uh, and herding of cattle um, and sheep and goats. It's with the introduction of cattle into Southern Africa that concepts like private property and uh, things like wealth and poverty and uh, social hierarchy become present in South Africa. Um, even farmers did not conceive of land as something to be held privately, at least not before the modern period, not really before the Europeans introduced that concept into Southern African society. Cattle, on the other hand, were held, were owned individually. Um, so were tools, and so iron uh, and copper and, you know, the, these metal technologies um, are really important for the concept of private property. But the most important property that people held in sub-Saharan Africa in general, and South Africa to be specific, um, was in the form of animals, domesticated animals. And uh, uh, the more animals a man owned, and, and this is very, I mean, these uh, cattle raising societies tend to be universally patriarchal and male dominated. There are um, agricultural societies in sub Saharan Africa that um, conceive of ownership of property following a female line, a, a kind of matriarchal line, um, and a matrilineal descent. Um, this is not necessarily germane for Southern Africa, it is for other parts of Africa. Um, these mixed farming communities and pastoral communities were very patriarchal, and the social hierarchy that emerged was based almost entirely on the number of cows a man owned. Um, and uh, the leaders of these societies, the chiefs of the chiefdoms, um, and the village elders, and so forth and so on, uh, tended to own the most cows and sheep and goats. Um, and so wealth or poverty was based, uh, conceptions of wealth and poverty, I should say, were based almost entirely on the ownership of animals. Um, and frankly, this is still present, at least, you know, 25 years ago when I lived in Southern Africa, um, uh, I spent six months of that, that two years that I was there in Botswana, and, you know, this, uh, the people who live there are descendants um, variously of, of different Bantu groups, um, especially the, uh, the Tswana and the Ndebele, um, but also of the Khoikhoi. And, uh, you know, people who lived in the city of Khabarone, the, the capital where I lived uh, for a time, uh, 
uh, who, you know, worked office jobs, um, all of them owned cattle. They had cows out somewhere. I would talk to them about, you know, okay, what are you doing this weekend? Should we get together? And they're like, no, I got to go out to my cattle post. Um, I need to make sure my cows are safe, right? Um, and uh, things like Lobola, which I'll talk about in a minute here, bride wealth based on uh, transfer of cattle, uh, was still present in Botswana 25 years ago. I assume there's still some vestiges of it around today, right? Um, so the ownership of cattle is just tremendously important to the economies and societies of Southern Africa. In addition to cattle, there are a few other considerations uh, in talking about these mixed farming communities introduced with uh, the diffusion of Bantu-speaking peoples into South Africa. First of all, the rainfall line, right? The 40-centimeter line, um, uh, we talked about this in a previous slide. I'm not going to go back to that map, um, but uh, roughly like right here, um, everything east of that uh, is good farm. I shouldn't say good. That's a very generic term. Um, uh, too diffuse to be helpful. Um, but everything east of the, east of that line, agriculture is possible. West of that line, in the areas where there are fewer than forty centimeters of rainfall annually. Um, uh, cattle raising is possible, and this is where the Khoi Khoi lived. Um, but uh, the further, uh, or the, the, the lower the rainfall level, the less and less it's possible to even raise cattle, right? And so, you know, over here into the desert region, we don't even have cattle raisers. Uh, only a few hunter gatherers, perhaps, who managed to eke out an existence up here in, the, in parts of the Kalahari that are, are better watered and have better sources of food, right? So that rainfall line is tremendously important, and as these these Bantu-speaking groups diffuse into southern Africa, um, you know they, they sort of diffuse up to that rainfall line, and uh, everything west of that, you know, they, they can't go any further because agriculture is not possible. Uh, some of them mix and, and merge with the, the Khoikhoi, and you know the Khoikhoi live in this area primarily. By the time Europeans arrive, this is really the state of things. Um, Bantu, the term is a linguistic one. Um, it's actually the term applied to a branch of the Niger-Congo language family, Niger-Congo B. Um, and, uh, I don't want to delve too much into historical linguistics here, but, um, uh, these Bantu languages emerged several millennia ago, maybe three to four thousand years ago, in the area around Cameroon in West Africa. Um, and Bantu-speaking peoples migrated from there um, uh, into and around the rainforest of Central Africa, into East Africa, and ultimately into Southern Africa, and brought with them these Bantu languages. Now, Bantu did not, uh, or Niger Congo B did not remain as a single language as they encountered new areas, as they split into different groups, they developed their own languages. Um, and you can see from this linguistic map of South Africa that there are a number of languages that became dominant in, in various areas. There were two main branches of Bantu in South Africa, um, and uh, these are the Sutu Tswana languages, and there are three major kind of um, specific dialects of the Sutu Tswana. There is Sesutu, which is the area in green here. Also, that would include Lesutu, um, hence the name, right? Uh, Setswana, and this is where Botswana, the, the, the term Botswana comes from, actually. It means the Tswana people. Um, but uh, this would extend up into Botswana. And then Sepedi, uh, otherwise known as Northern Sutu, but all of these are very closely related languages. Um, I did, when I lived in Southern Africa, learn a bit of Setswana and a bit of Sesutu. Um, and so, uh, for instance, um, to say a standard, um, uh, a standard farewell in um, in uh, Setswana is Salasintle, uh, which means be well or stay well, 
Um, in Sesutu, you would say salahantle, not salasintle. Um, but the sala is the same. The, the be or remain uh, is the same, but the, the well, the, the adjective for well is slightly different. It's sintle in, in Setswana, but hantle in Sesutu. Someone who speaks uh, one of these languages would probably understand uh, the other languages. It would be like a, a Spanish speaker, speaker would be able to understand a lot of Portuguese, right, um, or something like that, um, though they may be even more closely related than that. Okay, it's very easy, or I shouldn't say very easy, but it's it's certainly possible and, and common for a Tswana speaker to be able to to pick up speaking Sutu and speaking Pedi, depending on you know, people with whom he interacts. Um, the other main branch of Bantu that makes its way into South, Af in, into South Africa is called Nguni, and uh, there are three major, or I should say four major Nguni languages um, in, in uh, South Africa. Uh, the two most populous, most common are um, Isizulu, um, or simply Zulu, and Isikosa, um, the click you may have heard in there, right? Uh, but also um, Siswati, or Swazi, as it's otherwise known, and Ndebele, um, or Isi Ndebele. Um, which is spoken here, but also there are Ndebele groups up here into Zimbabwe um, and uh, so and, and into Botswana to some extent. Um, one of the things about Nguni languages, and in particular Isikosa and uh, Ndebele and Zulu, is that they have clicks in them. Now, Sesutu has some clicks as well. These clicks come from interacting with the hunter-gatherers and with the Khoikhoi, who had lots of clicks in their languages. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, these are the distinct sounds. Uh, Kosa, of all of the languages, has the most clicks of any Bantu language. Um, something like a third of all Kosa words, or something like that, have clicks in them. Um, and uh, it's you know, very common to, to hear lots of clicks when you know, someone is speaking that language. Um, I knew a lot of Kosa speakers, uh, and I used to practice the clicks um, just so I could, I didn't sound like an idiot when I tried to say words in the language, right? Um, so I've, um, anyway, it's, it's not actually hard, very hard to learn how to click. Um, come see me sometime and I'll teach you how to do this. Um, anyway. Um, so these are the major language groups, but they all descend from these, you know, from this common linguistic ancestor, Proto-Bantu. Uh, they have a lot of uh, um, linguistic uh, and features and, and even uh, vocabularies at some, to some extent in common with each other, right? So it's um, not difficult and, and, again, really quite common for uh, Southern Africans to be able to speak multiple languages. Uh, and you, you teenagers in South Africa who spoke five, six, seven languages. It was really kind of incredible. The Bantu brought with them, and there has been some historical debate about this, but it's almost certain that they did bring with them iron technology. And uh, South Africa is uh, rich in iron, and so they were able to take advantage of that. It's also very rich in copper, and so the use of copper became common. Iron mostly for tools, and copper mostly for uh, ornament for decoration, right? So copper bracelets, copper necklaces, copper earrings, copper headdresses. Uh, this is the most common uh, material, metal material and ornamentation uh, among the Bantu in Southern Africa. Um, iron use as a, as a technology for making tools uh, was tremendously important for farming. Um, so much so that the blacksmith uh, was one of the most prized and uh, honored people in the society, though blacksmiths were also seen as, and this is common across sub-Saharan Africa, also seen as possessing a kind of magic uh, that was maybe a little scary for some people, and so a blacksmith does have a kind of stigma attached to him, um, that even though he's honored and respected, people maintain their distance to the blacksmith. Drought, famine, and pestilence was common uh, in Southern Africa, and this is kind of cyclical. Um, uh, this probably kept population levels fairly low. Uh, people could expect, um, these Bantu farmers could expect within their lifetime to sort of go through cycles of boom and bust when it came to agriculture to come close to, um, close to, to perishing at times from, you know, from severe famine. 
Uh, pestilence among not only humans, but also among cattle was devastating. And we'll see some instances of that in the 19th century that are, that are truly terrible for the Bantu people and that allow the Europeans, in some cases, to take advantage of them. The productivity of farming in southern Africa in pre-modern times was never very great. Um, yields were extremely low. Uh, Swidden agriculture does not uh, is not a tremendously productive way to use the land. Um, you know, maybe the land is fertile for a year or two, but then they try to eke out a third or fourth or fifth or sixth year out of it. And, you know, um, the land often didn't produce a great deal. Uh, uh, droughts and, and famines and things like this were at times partially human caused because if uh, these farmers tried to work the land for too long, the nutrients would simply be depleted to the extent that they, they couldn't get a lot of uh, productivity out of the land. Right. So, um, uh, but land was abundant. Um, you know, I mean, the, the population levels were fairly low, and so it was entirely possible and common for um, these Bantu farmers to simply pack up their villages, pack up their crawls, and move to some other place and reestablish themselves. Um, uh, depending on the group, they built uh, uh, semi permanent or really rather impermanent types of dwellings, usually made of stone or brick uh, or wattle and daub, that is um, kind of mud and, and stick uh, architecture, right? Um, and uh, these were easily disassembled, and you know, they, the, the, the main things that they owned were quite portable, that is, their tools and their cattle. And so they would take these and move somewhere else where there was fertile land, right? So this was this was common. Um, so this is one of the reasons why um, they extend over such a large area, um, despite being fairly low in sheer numbers of people. Uh, Bantu societies tended to have fairly strict gender roles, um, and this remains the case all all the way to the present. Um, and is a, a an essential feature of the societies uh, in Africa. Um, of course, with you know, globalization and things like this, some of these attitudes are changing, um, certainly. But uh, you know, the traditional the traditions traditional gender roles have maintained their existence well into the modern world. Um, men's responsibility was to clear land, to uh, own and maintain the cattle to build the structures, to build the dwellings, the barns, the fences and other things. Um, men did the blacksmithing. Men owned things like cattle and tools. Uh, women, on the other hand, did most of the labor. Not only did they take care of the children, but they also, uh, in fact, this is um, one of the most important responsibilities that women had was to, to collect water, and so they had to walk several times a day, probably with uh, some sort of water-carrying vessel, um, usually on their heads, which is the most efficient place to carry a large load. Uh, this is one of the reasons why women in Africa are so adept at uh, carrying things on their heads. Um, they've been doing this for generation upon generation, right? Um, and it's taught at a very early age. I saw women in Africa teaching their young daughters who were two and three years old to start carrying things on their heads. Um, uh, but water collection uh, was a major part of that. Uh, once the men cleared the land, the women did the planting, the weeding, the harvesting, they prepared the food, right? So uh, men worked in, in kind of brief um, and intense spurts um, and women uh, did the day-to-day -day laboring um, uh, certainly, I think, in terms of hours worked, uh, worked far, far longer and harder than the men did. Um, and this is this is simply the traditional way of things. Um, not to condone that or anything like that, right? Uh, simply to say this is how these societies were set up. Polygyny was common. Um, men took multiple wives. Um, powerful men took, in some cases, dozens or even hundreds of wives. Uh, to demonstrate their their power, their place in the social hierarchy. Polygyny, which is the, the practice of men taking multiple wives. Polygamy is a more generic term that simply means plural marriage. 
polygyny is specifically men taking multiple wives. So women, in, in no case that I'm aware of, at least in Southern Africa, uh, was there the practice of women taking multiple husbands. Um, uh, but it was very common for men to take multiple wives. One of the, and this has a social impact that uh, is multifaceted and in many cases tremendously important for these Bantu societies in Southern Africa. Um, for one, this sets up rivalries between generations. It's the older, more established men who are able to take plural wives, and in many cases they take fairly young women as their wives because life expectancy was quite low in Southern Africa. Women um, died very commonly in childbirth. It's, a, it's a, a dangerous enterprise, especially with the absence of things like, um, well, um, sterile environments and antibiotics, right? So women didn't die bearing the children nearly so much as they did of infections that came from that sort of internal exposure, the exposure of, you know, sensitive areas of the body to uh, germs. Um, and so, you know, the practice of polygyny was to ensure that men would have, well, multiple sexual partners and, uh, you know, would always have women bearing children to reproduce the society. Children, children were very important um, because, uh, again, life expectancy is low and infant mortality was common. Um, and so, you know, I mean, all, polygyny does serve all of those purposes, right? Um, but it definitely keeps the men in a position of uh, status and comfort um, while the women do the majority of the work. Um, however, young men who were often excluded from this uh, uh, tended to be the entrepreneurs in these Bantu societies. And so let me paint a, a scenario, a plausible scenario here. Uh, a young man who you know has associations, friendships, even perhaps love affairs with uh, young women his age, uh, sees one by one all of these young female companions snatched up by the older men in the society, including perhaps his own, you know, their own fathers, um, and they get tired of this and decide to leave the society, strike it out on their own, maybe take some of their female companions with them and go and found a new village, um, set themselves up in, you know, a new situation. And this leads, this is one of the things that uh, produces the diffusion of human societies across Southern Africa. Right? Um, uh, and so these, these intergenerational rivalries were um, a source of change and transformation. Um, all across Sub-Saharan Africa, but certainly in, in South Africa. Uh, two other important practices in the society. Um, Lobolo is the process of initiation. Most of these Bantu societies require men, uh, women in some cases as well, but men, for men it's, it's universal, to undergo uh, an initiation ritual at the, the cusp of manhood, usually in their mid to late teens. Um, boys would be removed from society, would undergo teaching, uh, would have to prove their, their bravery um, and their mettle in, in certain ways, and then would uh, go through the public process of being initiated into the, into the clan, uh, into the chiefdom, by being circumcised. Um, and circumcision is the, by far the most common method that this happens. Well, this whole process in, in Bantu, in these Bantu societies is called Lobolo. The one who was in charge of Lobolo was the chief, but he was assisted by lore keepers, um, by the Dingaka, who I will talk about, the, the kind of spiritual leaders of the society. Um, and also by teachers um, who were set apart um, to educate these young men who were going through the process of Lobolo. Now, um, Lobola, a different term, means bride wealth. And so once a young man had undergone Lobolo and had proven himself, taken his place in the society, maybe entered into an age grade system, and I'll talk about age grades when we talk about Chaka Zulu, I don't want to get too much into the weeds here on that. Um, but he would be allowed to marry. The marriage would be arranged. 
and there would be a transfer of cattle from the groom's family to the bride's family. This would be after a process of negotiation where they would work out a suitable number of cows um, and uh, once those arrangements had been made, then the cattle would be transferred and uh, the young couple would be married. Um, for men who were more established, uh, they would simply pay out of their own herds to take plural wives, but labola also happens in that case, right? Um, and so once a man had gained some autonomy and some wealth, had some cattle uh, with which he could uh, take his position in the social hierarchy, he could pay labola himself to take plural wives. But for usually in the case of the first marriage, um, this would the, the parents would be the ones to work this out. Uh, Lobola, when I lived in Southern Africa, was still common. I, saw, I knew a lot of people who were, you know, uh, had gone through this uh, to, arrange, to, to enter into their marriage. Um, I talked with families who were in the process of negotiating Lobola. Um, so this is, this is still common. A few other um, points here. I don't want to go on too long. Um, but in every one of these Bantu societies, uh, a chief was of paramount importance. And there was variation, certainly, in the way the chief operated. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the modern kingdoms of Lesotho and Eswatini, uh, they still have kings, but these are really just descendants of these chief, these Bantu chiefdoms, and they, they continue to operate at least in their traditional respects um, along these very lines, right? Um, every year, for instance, the, the, uh, the king of the Swazi or Eswatini uh, chooses from among all of the eligible, young eligible women, a new wife um, to the point where he ends up having dozens or hundreds of them. Um, and, you know, these women dress up in traditional garb and dance before the, dance before the king. Um, uh, and, uh, and so that, that's still very much a, a thing, right? Um, chiefs tend to take special names, usually after um, the animals associated with their chiefdom. I'm not, you may see that I'm specifically avoiding the word tribe here, which is often used pejoratively. I, I think that it connotes a number of negative things that are inaccurate, so I'm going to use the word chiefdom or large kinship group or something like that, right? Um, but uh, anyway, these chiefs are of paramount importance, and so the chief would often take a name that um, was associated with his chiefdom and that uh, cast him as the kind of embodiment of the whole thing, right? So um, you know, and these are often simply the names of, uh, of important animals in Southern Africa, crocodile or cheetah or leopard or something like that. Okay. The primary responsibilities of the chief were to arbitrate disputes, um, to hold audiences, to make sure that he was accessible to his people, and to engage in diplomacy um, with surrounding chiefdoms. Now, diplomacy could, off, could also lead to warfare, and the chief would um, be responsible for leading his chiefdom in war, uh, or at least making arrangements for warfare to take place, right? So um, anyway, the chief is, is uh, an important figure in the society because he's the one who is the, not only the primary kind of executive authority and the symbol of his people, but also the primary arbiter of disputes. The judicial system runs through the chief, in other words. That said, chiefs did not have unlimited power. In these Bantu societies, there was an institution called the Pizzo, uh, which was a gathering of all of the, the prominent male members of the chiefdom, where they would talk through issues. It's almost like a parliament of sorts. Um, and in the Pizzo, uh, they could openly criticize the chief or even challenge his authority. And in some cases, as a result of the conversations in a pizza, there may be breakaway groups who go out and form their own new society, right? Um, and so uh, the chief was incentivized to make his people happy. Power in African societies in general, but for Southern Africa specifically, was not about power over land or even to 
for the most part, power over resources. Yes, cattle ownership was important and, and wealth was determined that way and wealth and power often went together. But without people, without control of people, there was no power in Africa, right? The chief could not be a chief if people didn't follow him. Um, and so there's this symbiotic relationship between the chief and his people. He needed to do things that made them happy, that made them content, that made them prosperous, and in turn, they gave him their assent. They acknowledged him as their leader. Um, they gave him honor. They gave him of their, you know, their daughters uh, to be his wives. Um, uh, he could potentially tax them to some extent. Um, Though to, you know, I mean, this is not necessarily that fundamental to the way the society's operated. But in any case, they gave him gifts. They gave him honor. Um, he married their daughters, and uh, he, you know, they they acknowledged him as the authority. Chief's authority was limited in other ways too. Um, oh, let me talk about warfare for just a minute here because this is this is an important point. Warfare in Southern Africa was largely symbolic, at least before the early 19th century with uh, the rise of Shaka Zulu, who we'll talk about next time, or I should say next week. Um, uh, warfare was largely symbolic. It was uh, um, an affair to demonstrate bravery. Um, warfare consisted mostly of uh, the, 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 the men of the society, the warriors of the society, you know, putting on ceremonial costumes, um, taking large spears and large shields and going out uh, onto a field and kind of throwing the spears at each other. Uh, when they got in close, they would use other kind of slashing weapons um, uh, and, and also their shields to, to beat one another. Um, uh, but, you know, the, this warfare did not produce a large number of casualties. It was mostly an effort to demonstrate their, their might vis-a-vis -vis their neighbors. Um, and, you know, uh, whichever side backed down first would have to negotiate and usually hand over maybe some cows, maybe some women, uh, you know, to become the wives of the other, you know, the, the, the men of the, uh, the victorious society. Um, but this did not change things in any really dramatic fashion. Certainly it changed things for the, you know, the lives of the women who were transferred. But um, in terms of large-scale social change, warfare simply was not um, a catalyst for that. Um, now, Shaka Zulu is going to change all of that. And that's, you know, this is a tremendously important um, sequence of events that we'll cover next week uh, with the so-called Mfekane. Religion, while the chief was to some extent a religious um, figure in that he was the one who kind of was the embodiment of the will of all the ancestors, he was not the one to, in, in most of these societies at least, to um, perform the religious rituals. That was in the hands of the Dingaka. Um, and here we have pictured a traditional Sangoma. Southern African. Uh, Sangoma is a, a uh, I think, a Zulu word for the Dingaka, um, but the spiritual leader, the healer, um, the traditional uh, lore keeper, right? The primary responsibility of the Dingaka was to divine the will of the ancestors. The ancestors were the medium between living human beings and the gods, um, but in the religion of these Bantu peoples, uh, they didn't pray necessarily to the gods directly. They prayed, uh, or they beseeched, I should say, the ancestors to intervene on their behalf with the gods, right? And so these Dingaka would have various methods at divining the will of the ancestors, at communicating with the ancestors, uh, who would then, you know, in the minds of the Bantu, at least approach the gods and, and uh, represent the uh, the chieftain uh, on you know on their behalf right um, uh, ancestor veneration was common all across sub-Saharan Africa it's especially acute in uh, in South Africa uh, among the various Bantu peoples there last point uh, in this lecture um, the relations with hunters hunter gatherers I should say and with herders were complex. Um, in the last lecture, I talked about this this old view that the 
the Bantu farmers had, had come and, and sort of driven the Khoi Khoi and uh, the Khoisan into the marginal lands and taken over the best parts of this. Um, but then this was all this was fairly recent and, and everything. These had come in these long uh, distance migration. I mean, all of that, that view has been overturned. And a much more complex and nuanced view of the relationship between these farmers and hunter-gatherers and herders has emerged in the scholarship. Um, there was a good deal of intermarriage between these various groups, right? Uh, in areas where hunter-gatherers and farmers lived in close proximity to each other, there was at times tension, um, and uh, farmers would often hunt down and kill uh, hunter-gatherers whom they saw as thieves. Um, there were certainly stigmas or stereotypes uh, perpetuated among the, the farmers about hunter-gatherers. Uh, they were seen as vermin, um, as pests, um, but at the same time they also traded with them. Um, and uh, in, in, some, in some of the Bantu lore, the hunter-gatherers, the San, are seen as the rightful possessors of the land, the ones who, uh, you know, had the closest tie to the land traditionally. And so it was common for these chiefs um, among the Bantu uh, to negotiate with the hunter-gatherers for wives. Um, and so they married these hunter-gatherer women um, to tap into the power that the Bantus perceived the hunter-gatherers had. Um, the Khoikhoi were not necessarily caught in the middle. There was a good deal of interaction between the Bantu mixed farmers and the pastoralists. They exchanged cattle. They, um, you know, uh, people from the Bantu society might uh, move um, away from their chiefdoms and take up residence among the Khoikhoi. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a good deal of mixing uh, and intermarriage between these three groups, though. There was also a, a fair amount of tension, certainly historically, between uh, these various groups. Um, and so, you know, like most phenomena in human history, the answer to the question of how did these groups relate to each other? Well, it's complex. It's, uh, it's multifaceted. Right? Okay, so we will next time uh, begin to talk about the Europeans and the way that they changed things uh, in South Africa, talking about the the arrival of the Dutch and later the British, um, but hopefully this has given you a sense of where the native Africans, um, and that term is uh, problematic as we now understand, right? Which, which native Africans are we talking about, but where these uh, African peoples came from and, and uh, what they were involved with, what kind of society they had long before the arrival of the Europeans in South Africa.